In this video, I'm going to derive an equation that describes mathematically what I'll call for now the, the conservation of stuff. Uh, this is a first step towards deriving the diffusion equation, but also uh, a few other equations that have a similar conservation of stuff, but with different laws describing how concentration or how molecules move. All right, so um, let's just start off with a simple situation we can handle in the context of this course. We're going to talk about a thin, narrow tube containing some kind of molecule in solution along the length. And it's uh, along its width, along the, the cross section, there isn't much scope for variation in concentration. And so we're going to be able to simplify this down to just describing um, a, what I'll call a linear concentration. So let's say we have a capital C of X, Y, and Z and time. And this is a traditional, traditional notion of concentration, which is measured in a number of molecules per unit volume. And you might measure that in molar or millimolar. Um, and so we don't want to deal with a function so complicated as this, and if just because we don't have the tools. I mean, we can write down a diffusion equation for a function like this, but not that is a one-dimensional problem, and that's what we'd like to restrict ourselves to for the purposes of this course. So if we are in a long, narrow tube like this, and there's not much variation in the y and z direction, in other words, along cross-sectional planes through here, then um, we can do the following. We can define what I'll call the linear concentration or the linear density as a function of space and time, but just one spatial dimension. And that is going to be equal to the full concentration. Uh, but because there isn't much variation in the y and z direction, I can just multiply this by the cross-sectional area at location x, which maybe it's constant everywhere, maybe it's a perfect cylinder, or maybe it varies. And so if that's the case, then I can define this little c of x and t, which is the linear concentration. And that has units of number of molecules per unit length, not volume, but length now. And that's the notion of concentration that we'll deal with throughout this discussion here. Okay, so that's one de definition I, I wanted to lay down before we get started. And the other one is the flux at position x t, time t. So the flux is defined as the number of particles per unit time passing uh, through a surface. And in this case here, we're going to define a surface. So imagine I take a little slice across here and stick a measurement tool or an observer sitting right at x. And counting how many particles move past. And what we're going to do is we're going to define uh, the flux to be positive. This is positive if the net movement of particles is to the right. And we'll define it as negative when they're moving to the left. So just as an example, if we were to put um, put a, a fluid with you know something in solution and we're keep, keeping track of whatever's dissolved in solution, let's say it's sugar water and there's sugar molecules throughout, and then we apply a pressure and we drive the fluid through the pipe, then we would define the flux to be proportional to both the velocity and the concentration, because if you increase the velocity, you'll have more, you know, double the, the velocity, you'll have twice as many particles crossing that green surface. And if you double the concentration, you keeping the velocity fixed, you'll, you'll also double the number of particles that move by. So this notion of flux will require that we define uh, j as v of x and t multiplied by c of x and t. Now this is not going to give us a diffusion equation. This is going to give us what's called a transport or advection equation. And, um, and that's a slightly different physical scenario. So let me um, just leave that as uh, 
uh, one definition of flux, and we'll get back to an, a, a diffusive definition of flux in a subsequent video. So in the meantime, what I'd like to do is, is write down or derive a PDE, or a, a, at least a differential equation, not quite closed yet, um, that tells us how the concentration C of T, C of X and T evolves in time. So if I take now, instead of just one surface with a flux going through it, now let's take a second surface further along. But these two surfaces can be anywhere along the tube. And I'm going to not call this one here X, but I'm going to define this as at location A and this one at location B. And so the total stuff in that section of tube, and I'll just color this in so we know where, where I'm talking about. So in that section of the cylinder, the total amount of stuff, meaning the total number of particles, is going to be given by the integral from A to B of C of X T dx. And what I want to do is I want to find a differential equation that tells me how this changes in time. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the derivative of this thing with respect to time and see if I can come up with some physical argument for putting something on the other side of an equal sign here. So how does stuff inside a piece of the tube change with time? Now, if nothing is created or destroyed within the confines of the tube, so let me actually put down here, this is going to be zero out here, and this will be L out here. As long as I stay away from zero and L, where something different might be happening, nothing is created or destroyed, things can only move around. So the only way for the concentration, the total amount of stuff inside this section of tube to change is if something crosses the surface at A or something crosses the surface at B. And now the net flux at A and B might be positive or negative, but I want to just write down an expression. So let's just assume for now that the flux at both locations is positive, are positive. And so what does the flux at B if it's positive, what should it do to the amount of stuff between A and B? Well, if it's a positive flux, things are moving to the right there, and that means I have to lose stuff from inside the tube. So that has to be accompanied by a minus sign so that I get the change in number of particles correct. But on the other end, at A, I'm going to be adding based on a positive flux. And you'll notice that if I have negative fluxes, then the correct thing happens as well. If J at B is negative, then this negative and a negative here make a positive, which means the rate of change of the total amount of stuff is going to be positive, and that means that things are moving into that region, which is what a negative flux should indicate. All right, so that is the expression that we here now have to work with, and I want you to just notice the structure of this expression. So I'm going to rewrite it as minus j at b and t, plus j at a and t. So that looks like the result of having taken, taken an integral. So what could the integral have been in order to give me something that looks like this? Well, that, that function here, j, has to be the antiderivative of the integrand. So if I write down an integral from a to b, then I have, first of all, there's a minus sign in front there, so I'll put a minus here. And then, well, I guess I don't really need brackets here. I need j, uh, well, the derivative of j with respect to x, that should be a partial. dx. And so the derivative of j with respect to x, if I take an antiderivative with respect to x, I get j, and then I'm evaluating from A to B, and that's exactly what the previous line is. So now I've made the expression seemingly more complicated, but I'm headed somewhere that is going to make it overall um, a nicer expression to work with. So in particular, notice that I have a DDT of this quantity here, and this is an integral with respect to X. So a derivative with respect to T, this is sort of, in a sense, this is independent of what's going on with the integral, so I should be able to bring that DDT inside. And there are, there are, there's theory dictating when I'm allowed to do that and when I'm not, and I'm not going to go into it, and I'm just going to let you trust me that 
that I can do this and I can write down the integral from A to B. Now it's a partial because it's underneath the integral sign and C is a function of X and T. And now I have an integral from A to B on both sides and some integrand dx. Now A and B, I just put them down in these locations over here somewhat randomly. I can make the same statement about an A and B over here and here, or an A here and a B out here, or an A and a B here and here. No matter where I go along the tube, I can always make this claim. And so when that's true, we can conclude that the integrands must be equal. So we know that dc dt has to be equal to minus dj dx. And now we're almost at a PDE. If we use, for example, this notion of flux, we could plug that in here for our j, and we would get what's called the, tra the transport equation. So that looks like dc dt is equal to minus d dx of v times c. And there we have a PDE, first order in time, first order in space, for the concentration that's moved not by random movement of particles, but by uh, being carried in a flow of a fluid. So that's not the diffusion equation, that's the transport equation. And so in another video, I'll talk about uh, constitutive law for describing how we get the diffusion equation and also address um, uh, the question of boundary conditions for a PDE of that type.